According to legend, Nina Saba casts no shadow and is native to West Virginia. She's a fiction writer and has a wingspan of eight feet. I want you to prove that. I see. Her eyes glow red when she is angered. One time, LeVar Burton said hi to her and it was awesome. If you say her name three times into a mirror, she will appear beside you and alphabetize her book, so I will take you up on that offer. But this is dangerous and should not be attempted alone. <laughs> and so it'll be alright. <laughs> also, this is Nina's last speakeasy reading. So we can all applaud and decide afterwards. <laughs> Nina. Kid, I loved the song and I didn't know what it was about. I thought it was just about a person who wrote books that were, you know, like, not hardcover. Um, <laughs> those of you who don't, who didn't laugh just now, you, I'll tell you when you're older. <laughs> so because it's my last speakeasy, um, I decided I would open with an older piece that is a prose poem because I do what I want. And then I'll read two flash fiction pieces and then we can all, like, sadly apply for each other. I'm good. <laughs> so this is a prose poem I wrote a few years ago called How to Be a Boy in Fairmont, West Virginia. Hot blue Monday. On the gravel path behind big lots, someone's dog is dead. There's a dare in the asphalt. In your dream of what happens now, you carry the warm body to the curb where your brother is waiting. Or maybe you kick off howling so no one can make you look. In your dream, there isn't anything to be afraid of. Name your ghosts. Lost voice, empty shoes on the bridge, flies in his cloudy eyes. This is how they'll remember you, shaking, legs the color of bruised apples. Go on, someone shouts from a safe bike. Ain't you scared? Across town, your translucent mother is setting out milk and potatoes, waiting for her family to return. This is not meant as an instruction. You know you've always been such a good boy. I just want you to know what you're missing. This next piece, I think most of you have heard before, but again, I do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> Advice for surviving the fairy tale. One, know that your happiness is temporary, no matter what. Your parents are farmers, or a woodcutter and his wife, or, God forbid, a king and a queen. Maybe your father gives you silly names and carries you around the room on his shoulders. Maybe your mother sings the way a river does. They are doomed regardless, and it isn't your fault. You can't help being the heroine. Two, keep provisions in a knapsack by your bed. There's no telling when the day will come. When you are alone out there on the empty highway, shoeless, wiping tears from your singed cheeks, you will wish you had more snacks. Your mother is dead, but she had a point about packing clean underwear. Three. Be polite to all travelers you meet. Some of them will help you, and some of them will hurt you, and some are just people whose stories briefly intersect your own. Be kind especially to old women who may or may not be villains in disguise. Pretend you don't know the difference. Lay your head on their shoulder, weep when they ask you what you have lost. Everyone, even a villain, wants to be useful. Four, remember, all things, good or bad, come in threes. Wait for the third carriage. Don't exhale until you've sneaked past the third moonlit hut. Don't trust the first or second brother. They don't know what to do with fire like you. Five, it doesn't matter where you're going, which is to say you have no control over where you're going. Wander and the road will shape itself to your destiny. If you were allowed to get lost, you would be in a different kind of story. Six, it helps to sing, morning songs especially, if you know any. No one knows why, but it does. Maybe it adds to the tragic ambiance. Maybe there's something irresistible about a woman who doesn't know to be silent. Seven, when the witch finds you, pretend you did not mean to be found. She will have heard your voice in the night, and something will draw her to you, a thing neither of you can explain. 
As she holds the door of her house open to you, you will look up at her and see that her eyes are the lightest shade of blue, like forget-me-nots or perfect summer days. You know that the dinner she cooks for you is only to lull you into vulnerability, but the wine is good and the mushrooms fresh. You know that witches are trouble, that they cannot be reformed, and yet when she puts her hands on your throat in the middle of the night, it will feel like a kiss. E. Leave the witch's house. No, really, you have to. Sweet girl, remember, you have no control over your story. You are walking toward the castle whether you want to or not. She will understand. She has met her once before. What, did you think you were the only one? Nine. The dragon in the field will not burn you if you are crying, so at least there's that. Stand and face the nearest head, all three at once if you can. It will give you a riddle which cannot be solved because dragons deal in non sequitur. All you have to do is point this out and you'll be free. Dragons are not equipped for existential thought. 10. The prince will be the one riding a silver horse just outside the city gate. He has golden hair and eyes like copper. He will not ask your name. You are welcome to sing to him, to see if it will draw him to you the way it drew the witch to you, but you can save your breath. What he loves is the sight of you, beautiful and burdened and in need of rescue. 11. The intrigue that follows will not require your participation. His mother is jealous, or his sister, or a princess from a neighboring land. Women in stories like yours are only good for fights. You don't have to fight back. In fact, you shouldn't. This is his moment now, his chance to prove that he can win you, when everyone knows that he will inevitably win you. 12. Love's true kiss will feel like nothing. It will be warm and wet and empty. It will not remind you of hands around your neck. 13. At the wedding, play grateful. Let the people praise you. Raise your eyes to God or whoever is in charge of these things, and if you scan the sky for a broomstick or a cloud of smoke, be subtle about it. She will not come. She will not have been invited. If you cry at the altar, you can always disguise it as joy. 14. After this, you must go it alone. The story ends here, with you inside the rose-covered walls looking out. It is a happy ending, remember. If you are lucky, one day you will give birth to a little girl with hair like a crow's wing and eyes like the clearest blue sky, and you will love her the way you once loved the view from your father's shoulders. Teach her how it is going to be. When you kiss the top of her head that first morning, know that you have this in common. Both of you, at the moment of this birth, have survived every moment of your life so far. And then there's one last thing, which is just called Anthem. I wrote it for a project called Girlhood, which is Pittsburgh-based, and you should check it out, um, because girls are great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's called Anthem. We learned beauty from the magazines. We learned beauty from our favorite shows. We learned beauty from our brother's pinups, from the billboards on the edge of town, from each other. We learned the geometry of eyelashes, volume, length. We learned the difference between lip gloss, lip stain, and lipstick. We learned contour and highlight. We learned to maximize. We were girls or women or neither or both. We were the princess and the monster in the same skin. We showed our claws and bared our teeth, and we were wild, wild, wild. We learned that prettiness was a weapon, and we intended to be the ones wielding it. Our nails were ragged or perfect, our hair shorn short or worn long, our jeans ripped at the knees. We were careful and careless. We spat out blood or shivered at the sight of it, used the wrong fork, said the right thing. We looked at boys, and we looked at girls. Their eyes on us were a camera we couldn't shake. There was something off about us. There was something strange in our bones. We were too big and too small, too quiet and too loud. We didn't love right, talk right, think right. We could always have been prettier. Someone told us, you can never be too rich or too thin, and why wouldn't we believe it? We were girls even when we weren't girl enough. We were girls even when we were too girl to be respected. We named ourselves that. We learned beauty from its absence. We learned beauty from ourselves. We learned the temperature of our wrists, the
the skin under our scabs, we learned the weight of hair, we learned how bodies move. We knew how an ache moved through us. We learned what we could ache for. We were hungry. We were tired. We hid our scratches under our sleeves, hoped they'd fade, and they didn't. We blurred the boundary between the wounded and the wound itself. Our pain was not beautiful, and so what? Our scars were not symmetrical, and so what? This was our rallying cry. So what, so what, so what? We kissed pillows and mirrors and photographs. We kissed boys at each other. We kissed in the dark, on the sidewalk, before the movie, after our parents were asleep. We kissed under the stairs. We kissed up on the roof and inside the bellies of cars we would eventually forget the make of. We knew this, that we were alive somehow and doing the best we could. We did not know this, that someday we would miss the girls we had been. Someday there would be mornings we'd long to pass back through the muddied years. We would want to spare ourselves so much. We would look at our own faces in photographs and decide whether or not they were beautiful. Oh, that old sorrow. Oh, the marks we would still bear. In the future, we would be other people. But here we were, still girls, still learning what we could carry. Teach me, we said. Teach me that. Thank you.